Thank you, David. <clears throat> um, yes, as uh, David said, we have collapsed or condensed uh, four chapters of that book uh, into one outline. And so, as you can imagine, uh, it is not quite the right way or the best way to uh, enter into these things. Uh, so I like to admonish you and uh, um, ask you um, the saints, the churches participating in this conference, that it is your job under the brothers leading where you are to uh, quote unquote unpack uh, these things and do not worry in the uh, in the original book how to meet there they are chapter by chapter and uh, trust me these things each one of them um, is important and uh, and now uh, starting tonight really we are entering into the realm of doing the realm of practice the realm of living and as we will see even the realm of demonstrating something and that is our spirit so whereas these are still you may say principles still principles but they are not just mental principles or principles for just a kind of um, um, uh, mental understanding they are principles for us to practice, to work something out. You know, you, for you to do something, you need to learn the principles. And the principles are what would help you to implement, to work out those things. So these are, I would call, working principles and not academic ones. I hope, brothers and sisters, you will really... Um, uh, do this. And that's all I can say. I cannot force you to do anything. But uh, the burden this weekend is a great one, and a serious one, and a urgent one, um, and timely, a timely one. Uh, these things that are, um, uh, this matter of the meeting life is something the Lord must uh, reinvigorate, that the Lord must revitalize, the Lord must revivify us to carry out. Um, otherwise, our church life will not um, satisfy him, will not be adequate to even satisfy ourselves, much less to satisfy others, to satisfy men. Now, uh, these uh, one hymn per message that I have uh, uh, asked us to sing, uh, all almost consecutively in a particular section in our hymnal. You know, our hymnals are all under different categories and subcategories. And this is all in that main category of meetings, meetings. And I suppose uh, these uh, hymns are not the most popular one. In fact, they may not be sung uh, so much among us. And I did choose these hymns deliberately for that reason, to familiarize us with them so that we can use them as we go forward in our renewed practice of the meeting life. They are all written by brother uh lee himself and uh what can i say i can tell you this that as a young man and uh and 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 even thereafter uh, i sing i sang these hymns and we used to sing these hymns a lot uh we don't consider them as uh you know uh as light and as uh as something easy we really benefited a lot from singing them. There are actually many other hymns. If you uh, go into your uh, outlines, uh, actually there are quite a number of other hymns offered there, you know, in different points and 
and so on. And those hymns are really worth your singing. So part of the uh, studying or getting into these material is in fact not just by reading and and not even just by praying. How about I add this by singing, by singing. And sometimes the singing uh, has a way of activating our spirit, of stirring up our inner being, uh, of inspiring us uh, to go forward to do something um, in some spiritual activity. Hymns do that. Songs do that. So I hope that you would do this. In fact, part of the strengthening and the renewing and the uplifting and the enriching of our meeting life is, in fact, in this further recovery of singing. I would need another conference, at least if not a series of training meetings, just on singing the hymns, uh, including the matter of praising. Um, This is something, again, I feel we have receded quite a bit, uh, just in the singing, even the singing, uh, in many instances, have become kind of a, well, sorry to say, I uh, this morning I said something not very nice, and that is in our Lord's ta- at the Lord's table, that it has become a kind of sing-along. We sing, you know, hymn after hymn after hymn, and there would be not much praise that emanate from the singing. Um, we would not uh, delve in, and uh, use the hymn, use the song, use the lyrics and the words to give a richer and higher praise to the Lord or to the Father, for that matter. And we just sing, and then um, and then we stop, and then there's some silence and uh, some some um, 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 pretty painful silent times, and then someone else have to call a hymn just to uh, fill the gap. Uh, um, because it is, uh, um, uh, it's a little bit hard to bear, so we sing another one. Then we sing another one, you know, from verse 1 to verse 5, from verse 1 to verse 6, or whatever it is. And so many of the Lord's table, which should be a fervent, a time of fervent and passionate um, uh, remembrance of the Lord himself, his life and his person, uh, just um, 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 uh, becomes a kind of just uh, uh, calling hymns to fill up the time. The the shortage, as we will see in this message, this is a very important message, is on the spirit. Even tomorrow we will spend more time on this matter, is the exercise of our spirit. This is not a light thing. This is not a superficial thing. Oh, exercise the spirit. Uh, 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 shout something, say something. No, I tell you, the exercise of the Spirit has everything to do with everything in the our Christian life and especially in our meeting life. This song uh, is on, uh, we just sang, is on exercise the Spirit. There's another song, I think, in uh, in either the section under the church or the section under prayer, I don't quite remember. It's called, Release My Spirit. For this I pray. Re- th- not just exercise the Spirit, it is to release the Spirit, uh, somewhat similar to demonstrating the Spirit. It is a strong form of exercising the Spirit. It's not just murmuring something, not just mumbling something, but you actually... Uh, push out the spirit. You demonstrate your spirit. You you show. You display this your spirit, the mingle spirit. Um, uh, you release the spirit. It is by the releasing of the spirit that we what that we minister Christ, that we minister life to others. Because uh, only the spirit gives life, not our human spirit. Yet today. Christ, the life-giving Spirit, has been um, um, has come into our human spirit to mingle with it, to make it one spirit. All right, the mingle spirit. So, according to the principle of incarnation, when we, 
use our spirit, when we exercise our spirit and release our spirit in a proper way, the mingled spirit will be there. And this mingled spirit would include the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, and even the Lord himself. It is by doing that that we minister Christ to one another. You know, even just now, these dear uh, young brothers and sisters from uh, Richmond, right, uh, singing uh, with enthusiasm. I like that. I hope they're not performing it for us. That is not our choir or band in the corner. I hope not. I, but we, we should, this is not a performance. We, we don't come to the meeting to perform today. The sorry situation of uh, uh, Christian meetings, by and large, it has become a performance. Even the singing is a performance. You need the band up there. You need the, the drums. You need the guitar. You need whatever uh, to be up there doing something. You need the choir and, uh, and so on. It has become, and in some cases, it is a full-fledged performance like what you see in concerts, what you see in Hollywood, what you see in, you know, uh, these kind of uh, 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 places. Brothers and sisters, that's wrong. That is, that, is, that is a fallen condition. That is a degradation. No, I tell you, we believers, we have been made with a mouth. Am I right? And this mouth is for speaking. This mouth is for breathing. This mouth is for eating, for sure. But I tell you, we're made with a mouth to use to what? To call on the Lord, to pray, to pray. And uh, to sing, to sing, you know, uh, my goodness, uh, uh, the overcomers, they are all singers, you know, they sing a new song. And uh, uh, the, the Old Testament, the book of Psalms and, and other places is just full of singing, full of making melodies. And in the epistles, um, we are to what speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um, we are to uh, teach in one another. Listen in Colossians, the sister verse to Ephesians chapter five eighteen says that we what we are, should admonish and teach it one another in psalms and hymns and and in so, with songs. Can you imagine admonishing, exhorting with a hymn? What's wrong with some of us this week? I've been enjoying some hymn deeply to the uttermost uh, in my daily experience. And that would be what the very produce produce that I have labored on uh, to bring to the meeting as my experience, as my contribution. As my offering to the Lord, the real offering, my experience of Christ and body in a hymn, hymn. And I would stand up on the Lord's Day or whatever meeting and share that. I would even maybe sing that to the brothers and sisters. I would speak that hymn. I would say something of how enjoyable that hymn is. And by doing so, I'm ministering Christ to you. You see, brothers and sisters, this is a, 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 I would say today, one of the main reasons our meetings are suffering uh, from death, from silence, from uh, lack of inspiration uh, and attraction is due to simply to one thing, the lack of the spirit. The spirit is missing. The Holy Spirit is missing because our human spirit is missing. The mingle spirit is missing. We are not using our spirit. Rather, we're in our mind, we're in our emotion, we're in our soul, we're in our natural life. And when we come to uh, during the day, and when we come together, we are just dry. We don't have anything of the Lord. Uh, we don't have a habit of using our spirit in the meetings. And so we sit there. We sit there. Uh, and... Sometimes we may do something, and even they would come out in the way somewhat of a performance. I'm not here, brothers, dear brothers and sisters, just to be judgmental and to be critical of us. No, I'm here to say the truth. 
to tell you that our situation is not good. We need to recover a recovery of our meeting life, and this has to be something weighty, something real, and not something just a kind of a, uh, a temporary stirring up. It has to start with our daily life, and then it will end in our meeting. And from our meeting, we go back to our daily life, and it becomes something slick, cyclical. The way we live would affect the meetings, and the way the meetings are would then affect our daily life. When we continuously uh, have what, uh, uh, continually have weak meetings or silent meetings or meetings without encouragement, meeting that is not that are dead, I tell you that will impact our daily life. We don't leave the meeting encouraged. We don't need leave the meeting more stirred up. We leave the meeting more dead, maybe. And so this this virtue may this be a virtuous cycle among us: our daily life and the meeting life. <clears throat> okay. Now today we have actually four main working uh, principles uh, that. Involves working means it involve, involves our doing. It involves our regular practice. May I say this? You may not believe me when I say this, but it is the truth. I know <clears throat> that I am, uh, you know, I'm this uh, uh, born Chinese, okay, and uh, <clears throat> the Chinese are. Generally, uh, you know, I came from the Far East. Are generally more uh, <clears throat> not as exuberant and more conservative. You know, that's that's a culture, <clears throat> and uh, 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 you know, we don't shout and do things like this like the good old Americans do. Okay, and then not only that, I'm born a, a kind of an introvert person. This is my makeup. You know, that's that's just how I am. I mean, uh, I like to be private. I like to be alone. Uh, if you put me on an island, just give me some sustenance. I'll be quite okay. All right, I, I'm just kind of like that. And uh, the first meeting I ever I came to in the in the recovery in the United States, that is in L.A., happened to be a Tuesday night prayer meeting. I had I just stepped off a Greyhound, 21 hours Greyhound from Oregon to L.A. City. And I was whisked to this prayer meeting of the church, and my goodness, I've never been in a Christian prayer meeting like this. Every, people's eyes were open to me; is sacrilegious. Uh, people were all. Uh, uh, someone is shouting in prayer, and everyone in unison says "Amen" like this. I could hardly stand it. It is. It blows my religious mind. It is entirely contrary to what I'm used to. I think to worship the Lord, one has to be reverent. One has to be quiet. One has to uh, um, um, be considerate. You know, there's the time to sing. There's a time to pray. There's a time to do this or or that. But this all just totally the opposite, and they're not acting it up. It was just like normal. Uh, I almost told the people that. Took me from from the Greyhound station downtown to take me back. I said, "This is not for me. All right, this is not for me. I'm not this kind of person." Well, the Lord had mercy. The Lord is sovereign. I, they won't take me back anyway. And so it was in that week, that week, the Lord caught me for His recovery through a conference of brotherly speaking. To young people, to young people, not many of us, but I was there. And he spoke on Christ as the life-giving Spirit. He spoke on uh, 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 on eating and drinking. He taught. He spoke on calling and uh, on the Lord. Pray, reading the Word. He talked about eating and drinking and breathing and and, and all these things. And and and. Eventually, uh, uh, in one in particular occasion, the, the the brothers there who were trying to help me to come in uh, sort of cornered me and forced me in a way to 
exercise my spirit for the first time. They just go around the circle, and I was there, and let's do it one by one around the circle. And I know what they're doing, but I couldn't leave. I was cornered. I was captured there. And then the funniest thing happened, the experience I have, was that um, while at this one, on the one hand, my whole natural religious person was just against it, was just hating this, was just wanting to run out of the door. But there is another feeling deeper within me. I feel like I am a kind of a plucked up, um, um, you know, pipe that needs to be busted through, that needs to be cleaned, that needs for, for, for water to flow for the first time in my life. And so eventually when it came to me, I don't know where I got the strength, where I got that strength to lose my face, basically. And I jumped in. I shouted. I I released my spirit publicly for the first time in my life. This conservative, introverted Chinese young man. And I'll tell you, all, all the stuff that has been collected just there in this pipe got busted through by that one shouting. I call on the Lord. I became a different person since that point. I became a caller. I become a breather. I become a pray reader. I became a singer. Um, that doesn't mean in, uh, in, the, in the subsequent days, I don't need to fight against my disposition, to fight against my, you know, to lose my face, to, to exercise my spirit. But I had the beginning there. And with that, I constantly, I just told myself, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go against myself. I'm going to go against my face. I'm going to exercise my spirit because this is the only way I can eat, drink, and breathe Christ. This is the only way I can touch life. This is the way I can enjoy Christ. And I did that. And all the years since then, I exercised and exercised. I am not what you think, you know, a natural sitting here just to speak to hundreds and in other meetings to thousands. Um, uh, no, I'm not that type. This is not natural for me, still is not. But I like to be here as a testimony to all of us that, brothers, if we would cooperate with the Lord, if we would go against ourself, if we would stand against our natural disposition, to exercise our spirit, to demonstrate our spirit, to release our spirit, we can become that kind of a person. So don't use your natural uh, disposition as an excuse. We all need to stand against that because we, are, we cannot live in our natural man anymore. We need to live in the new man. We need to live in our new man, and that new man is related to our inner man, and our inner man is simply our mingled spirit. We need to pray to the Father that he would strengthen us with might by his spirit into our inner man. Without the exercise of our spirit, I tell you, brothers and sisters, we cannot have the normal Christian life. We cannot have a rich Christian life. We cannot have a full church life. What is short, what is short today in the churches is this kind of exercise. I'm not saying we, we play, we perform, we act up, you know, we have fun. Don't do that. Don't do that. But we should what? We should, in a very, very serious way, very solid way, uh, with much understanding, right? As we use our spirit, we also use our mind except our spirit is in control. Our spirit is the master, using our various faculties uh, that the Lord has created in us, in our soul, to express it. Just like uh, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, when he met Elizabeth, her cousin, they prophesied to one another, and uh, Mary said, what, uh, my... my uh, 
uh, my spirit exult, right? Um, something like this, and then my soul. Uh, what does it say? Someone, please <laughs> help me find that. I I don't know why I forget it uh, at this uh, at, at this point. Uh, no, this is in Luke. I think I'm, I'm, I I got it wrong. Well, you, you I don't have the time. You can go look it up um, in chapter. This is uh, chapter two, huh? Am I right? You see, I I cannot I cannot do it right now. And anyway, you can look for it. He talked. She talked about her spirit. She talked about her soul. The spirit is where he, she exalts, and the soul is where she would express Christ. And this is how the thing should be ordered. All right, I'm taking too much time even to uh, talk about that. But no, no, this is a main burden of this uh, message, and even the one tomorrow. Okay, let us come here to uh, this uh, the, this message today. Four things, four working principles. Number one, meeting in the Lord's name. What does that mean, right? Number two, meeting by love and by prophesying. All these are fundamental, important principles, all right? Number three, with a proper life, daily life, daily living in spirit. And number four, by demonstrating our spirits, this is in the meetings. All right, let's just go through this. I think I can finish this in time. You have to follow up to get into these things, chapter by chapter in the book. A, the reality of meeting uh, in the name of the Lord is to meet in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 18, it says, whenever we would meet into in or into his name, there am I in your midst. What a marvelous promise from the Lord himself. But what is to meet in the name? It's not just me standing here saying, we're here meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus, then we're in the name. No, no, it does not mean that. We need to find out the reality of being in the name or meeting in the Lord's name. And we're finding out here, as we will see, to the reality of meeting in the name of the Lord is simply to meet in the Holy Spirit. The name of the Lord, Jesus, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, are absolutely related. You cannot tear them apart. Number one, concerning the truth of the Christian meetings, which is what we're covering this weekend, to be in the name of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, you know, in the Gospels, it talk about this, is the seed of, the, of this truth of Christian meeting, and that's in Matthew 18. Uh, to be in the name of the Lord, to receive the Holy Spirit. That is in the book of Acts. There's book of, in the book of Acts, you have to go to Acts 2.38. Now, what does it say in the Acts, the book of Acts 2.38? Uh, there's so many verses here. Uh, it says, and Peter said to them, uh, repent, and each one of you be baptized upon the name of the Lord Je of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the condition of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit himself, is what? Is that we need to be baptized upon the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. So the name and the spirit are related, deeply related. And the understanding of what, what is revealed in the book of Acts is the growth 
is the growth of this matter, the development of this matter. And to be in the spirit in the epistles is the harvest, the harvest. Uh, recall that verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No man can say, Lord Jesus, but except in the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, this does not mean you say Lord Jesus in a vain way, right? In a meaningless way. This means you really call, you really say, you really declare, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. You really declare, Lord Jesus. When you do this, when you do this, you are automatically in the Holy Spirit. The reality of the name of Jesus is the person of Jesus, right? We always use this this uh, illustration. When I say, David, come, David, come, come to me, right? That's a name. I'm just saying a name. But who would come to me? David, the person. He would respond to my call and come to me with his person. So the name and the person are one. I would not say to him, I just say, David, come. I don't want you to come. I just say, David, come, come. Well, he said, I am David, come. You call my name and I'm here. That name, the reality of that name is just me. Brothers and sisters, when we call Lord Jesus, it's not vain. We are calling on a person and that person is living and will respond with his presence, with his coming to us. Do you believe that or not? Lord Jesus, that's why we need to call on the Lord. We need to, as the hymn says, we need to say his name a thousand times a day. Lord Jesus, sometimes uh, loudly, sometimes quietly, sometimes in a way of soft breathing, sometimes in a way of deep breathing. I tell you, dear saints, we even need to recover the matter of calling on the Lord. I have... Several messages, one, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, outlines wonderfully put together on calling on the name of the Lord. I, I, I gave that because I see even today, you know, uh, 50 some years, 60 years later, even the, the exercise, the practice of calling, the effect of the calling is that even that is somewhat dwindling, somewhat diminishing. You see, we, we we need to breathe, brothers and sisters. Okay, I, I'm 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 going off a little bit here. So, to be in the spirit in the epistles is what is the harvest of this matter of gathering in the Lord's name. So, when we say we meet in the Lord's name, it simply means. We meet in the Lord's person, and the person of the Lord today is nothing but the Spirit. The Spirit is the reality of Christ's person, all right? The Lord is the Spirit. The last Adam became a life-giving Spirit, you see? So the reality of that name is of Christ, not just of that name, but of Christ himself is the spirit in our experience. Two, thus we see that the name of the Lord Jesus is very much linked with the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no reality of the name of the Lord Jesus. If David Cone doesn't exist, I can call day and night, there will be nothing, nothing will happen because he, he's not real. There's not that person, you know, in existence. So Jesus Christ exists. He is the reality, and even the Spirit is called the Spirit of the reality. So today, so today, um, we have the Spirit, okay? And when we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, we will get the Spirit. And that Spirit is the reality of the name upon which we call and in which we assemble ourselves. Three, all the power and reality of the name of Jesus is in the Holy Spirit and is the Holy Spirit. 
in that name, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, hymns on that name. Mighty name, mighty name. In that name alone we win. Am I right? It, it, it shows us today all the power in heaven and earth, all the authority in heaven and earth are all in that name. In fact, you know, before that name, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord. Right? This name, this name is what? Is the name of authority. This name is the name of power. Everything is in this name. Whatever you need is in this name. Whatever God has to give to us in Christ is in this name. Everything. So today, we what? We just need to what? Gather into this name, and that is to gather in the Spirit by the exercise of our spirit. We enjoy all these things, all these riches, all this power, all this reality. For in John 1, uh, 14, 26, the Lord tells us that the Holy Spirit will be sent in his name. The Lord Jesus promised to give us something in his name. And what he gives us is the Spirit. And it's marvelous. You have to go, go to read uh, John 14, 26. The Spirit, again, is the reality of that uh, of of his name. But the Comforter, uh, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all things which I have said to you. The Father, the Father will send the Spirit, but he will, the Father will send it in the name of the Son, in the name of Christ, in the person of Christ. And that 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 thing that or that person that he will send is the comforter. Is the comforter, the second comforter, which is the spirit himself. Do you see this? The name is Jesus, but the person is the spirit. Marvelous. Just this is just too too. Wonderful. Five, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, we read, No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. When you call on the name of Jesus, you are in the Spirit. You call Lord Jesus, and you get the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the reality of Jesus. B, since the Holy Spirit today is in our spirit, now the Holy Spirit given to us, abides with us and is in us. If we don't have the Spirit, we are not of His in Romans 8. Today we have the Spirit, and the Spirit is mingled with our human spirit. So today we have a regenerated spirit and a mingled spirit. How do we experience the Spirit then? We just need simply to exercise our spirit. Exercise this mingle spirit. So as we call, what are we doing when we call on the Lord? We're actually exercising our spirit and touching the spirit of the Lord. The key, the secret of our meeting together is the exercise of our regenerated human spirit. 1 Corinthians 14.32 is the strongest proof. Verse 31 tells us that we can all prophesy. Then in verse 32, follows by telling us that prophesying is just the exercise of our spirit. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet. You know, brothers and sisters, when we come to gather, to meet, we don't need to wait. I already told you this morning, actually, Jesus is already there waiting to meet with us. But he's in our spirit, in our spirit. So there's no need for us to wait. We just take the initiative and exercise our spirit to call, to pray, to sing, to speak. And as we do that, 
as we do that, as we exercise our spirit in this way, the spirit, the Holy Spirit will be present. The Lord as the spirit, the life-giving spirit will be there, moving, acting, doing things through our exercise of the spirit. You may say, my, this is unbelievable. We can bring the spirit in. We can activate the spirit. Yes, this is the mystery of incarnation. Today, we are not waiting on God. Today, God is waiting for us. Let us exercise our spirit more and more. To prophesy means to take the initiative to exercise the spirit. It seems that we take the lead, but when we do, the spirit of God follows and flows out because today the Holy Spirit is mingled with our spirit. We all should have this experience, and I as a minister, a speaker in in many situations, I can definitely tell you too, too many times as I approach the podium, as I stand in front of the saints, there's not that much feeling. Yes, I might have prepared the, the message, but there may not have been that strong flow and strong feeling. But that's not the time for me to wait. I just begin to, by faith, you know, faith and the exercise of faith and the exercise of the Spirit are also related. We having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. This is in Second Corinthians. So we, I just begin to exercise my spirit to pray, to speak. I tell you, the Lord comes in. The spirit begins to flow. Utterances are given to me. The, the, the anointing begins to flow. And I tell you, then I gave the message. Dear brothers, whether we speak for one minute or for one hour, the principle is the same. Take the initiative. Don't wait. Don't be silent. Don't, don't wait for inspiration. Just exercise your mingled spirit. See, we need to see the way to exercise the spirit. Number one, we can take the action and initiative in our spirit just by saying, Lord Jesus. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. May the Lord recover our calling. May the Lord recover our much calling. Like breathing all the time. We cannot live without oxygen. We cannot live without calling on his name. When you say, Lord Jesus, you're in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's no need for you to wait for inspiration. You're already in it. We all have to learn to say, Lord Jesus, in the meeting, in our home, and a thousand times a day. You, you all know that hymn, don't you? Ah, about our loving the Lord. Uh, we would mention his name a thousand times a day. It's not too much. I don't know how many breaths normally on the average a human being would take per day. Maybe, uh, maybe David, you can help me as a, as a doctor. We need to breathe the Lord just like that. Try that. Maybe even that practice has waned in some of our lives. We need to come back and call again. Number three, then in the meetings, the second way to keep yourself in the Holy Spirit is to prophesy. To be in the Holy Spirit means to prophesy. But whether we call, whether we prophesy, whether we sing, as I said, whether we pray, and sometimes even whether we praise, praise is the strongest, highest form of prayer. I tell you, when we do this, exercise ourselves in this way, the Holy Spirit is ours, and the Lord himself is ours. 
Roman 2. I'm going to leave Roman 3 for tomorrow morning. So I'm just going to cover 2 and 3. We need to meet by love and by prophecy, the greater gift and the excellent way. Even some of us who have read this chapter needs to go back again. This is simply amazing. Amazing. Brotherly restudy in those days. This is like 50 some years, 50 years ago. First Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. To restudy the matter of how Christians should meet. Over the years in the recovery, the, the, the Lord's servants have always been studying this matter. Studying this matter how we should meet as New Testament believers, as the New Testament church of the Lord. My, and this light came to him, and this is just just too, too marvelous. The conclusion is what? Is by love and by prophecy. Let's see what this means quickly here. A, at the conclusion in 1 Corinthians 12, the apostle says that we should earnestly desire the greater gifts. And the greater gift is not speaking in tongues or healing and those kind of things, but prophesying. We, we know that if you go and you read those chapters, especially chapter 14. For it is prophesying that builds up the church. Recall this morning, we meet for the ascended Christ to build up the church's body. And the way the apostle taught us to do, what to do in the meetings of the church, is that we need to prophesy. Those who prophesy builds up the church. All right? This is the highest gift there is as far as our function in the meeting is concerned. It's not speaking in tongues, trust me. It is to prophesy, to speak forth Christ. B, Paul told us that we should earnestly desire the greater gifts. Yet, He also said this, that he would show us a most excellent way. One thing is the gift. The other thing is the way. The way. The way to meet. The excellent way is love. Oh, I just just love this. This is chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. With love as the way and with prophecy as the exercise or the gift Brothers and sisters, we have a wonderful working principle concerning how we should meet. See, from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, the main impression we get is that there are two outstanding things that we must seek. I want to underscore this. We must seek. We don't have it naturally. But let's pursue this. Let's pursue prophecy. Let's pursue love. We need to pursue love, and we must seek to prophesy. Love is the life on the life side, and prophecy is the function side. You may say love is with the resurrected Christ. Prophecy is for the ascended Christ. You may say that. We need to realize that both love and prophecy are things of the Spirit, that these are the very things that build up the church. In 1 Corinthians, we can see that there are only two things that build up. In chapter 8, verse 1, love builds up. The Apostle Paul say, knowledge puffs up, just puffs you up. You know, more knowledge just swells your head, gives you a big head. But love builds up. And the second is prophecy. Prophecy Builds up the church. Speaking in tongues may build up a person singularly. But prophesying builds up the church. Brothers and sisters, I think you will agree with me. We also need a great recovery and advance in our so-called prophesying meeting. Or 1 Corinthians 14 meeting, sometimes called You know, it has been also 30 years that Brother Lee has promoted that meeting. We have started to have these meetings. Most churches do it on Lord's Day. But I think you will agree with me, those meetings are still not so satisfactory because the number of things 
who prophesy and the content of our prophecy is still not as strong and rich and universal as it should be. I hope we will continue to exercise with with regards to that kind of particular meeting. You see, we're covering this meeting life. This this touches every part of of the church life. All right, E, finally, in chapter 15, we're told that this Christ, this is in 1 Corinthians, this Christ who is our love and life, our prophecy and our function, is the life-giving spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, we need to live a life of love. That means a life of expressing Christ in this top virtue, the highest Christian virtue, the most inclusive, the most aromatic, is nothing greater than love. There abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Everything will perish. Everything will go away. Everything will cease to exist. But love will remain unto eternity. Today, this love is simply Christ. And we have to touch this Christ, experience this Christ, call on the name of this Christ so that we can live him out as love in our life, in our marriage, in our family, with our spouses, with the people around us, with their brothers and sisters. Rather than what is taking over the world, it is hatred, am I right? It is animosity, am I right? All these kind of things. No, today we have the source of love in Christ, and we need to pursue him, loving him, and to know him as love. Love is just an all-inclusive term for all the positive virtues, endurance, long-suffering, meekness, forgiveness, forbearance, all these things are pictures of love. Go and read 1 Corinthians 13. I wrote a hymn on 1 Corinthians 13. I call it, Oh, Perfect Love. And this covers all the positive virtues, Christian virtues there. But the prophesying is our what? Something we do. Love is what we live. Prophesying is what we do and how we function in the meetings, how we use our gifts to minister Christ to build up the church. Three, this is the end. We need to meet with a proper life in spirit. Now we talk about this daily walk. This touches this matter of love, all right? You know, the meeting doesn't start at 7.30 p.m. It starts at 7.30 a.m., if you know what I'm trying to say. We have to have a living that matches the meeting. The meeting, how the meeting will be, depends on our living. How we are during the day will determine how, what the outcome will be when we gather ourselves. These two things cannot be separated. If we do, that makes us a two-faced Christian. Sorry to say, even in the Lord's recovery in the church life, we can become two-faced. In the day, we're like, we live out the devil. In the meeting, we transform ourselves into an angel. You know what I'm saying. A performing angel. This cannot be. This cannot be. We meet the way we live. And we live for the meetings. This is what a, what a principle this is. If we are going to meet in a proper way, we must experience and enjoy the Christ whom 
the, uh, whom First Corinthians represents, then we will have him as our life in the spirit and in our daily walk. Clearly, Brother Lee was quite taken in those at that time with the book First Corinthians. And if you study First Corinthians, there are what? How many items there I forgot of Christ from chapter 1 on Christ being God's wisdom. Am I right? Both righteousness and sanctification and redemption all the way to the end. Christ, the last Adam, is the life-giving spirit and everything in between. He is the Passover feast. Am I right? He is the spiritual rock. And 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 so on and so forth throughout this whole book, First Corinthians. Now we need to experience this Christ every day, and so that we can live him out, live him out, this Christ out in our life and in our daily walk. How do we do this? We just simply have to determine to walk in spirit to live according to the Spirit day by day. That's a normal Christian life. Brothers and sisters, we can do this. We're meant to do this. Don't think this is too high. But we need to practice. Because this is not a natural walk. This is an unnatural walk. We need to practice. We need to practice to walk in the Spirit, to set our mind on the Spirit, to live Christ. B, when we come together, then we need only to exercise our spirit to prophesy something, uh, something of Christ. When we meet together, we can say something of him whom we have already experienced and enjoy in our daily living. This is the way for us to meet. In this sense, if we live this way, when we come to the meeting, We can just simply, spontaneously exercise our spirit. And there will be something to say something, to pray something, to speak something, to I mean, to sing something, whatever the activity may be. Something of the Christ that we experience and enjoy during the day will come forth to be minister to the brothers and sisters. And they will be encouraged. They will be consoled. They will be built up. You see, this is 1 Corinthians 14. It's not a performance. Brothers, don't perform. Sometimes you can smell a performance. The person doesn't live this way. He just knows the right words to say, the right, right prayer to utter. No, no, you can touch it. If you exercise your spirit, you will know This is not so real, right? At other times, you know this saint is overflowing. He's just overflowing something that he or she has been enjoying of Christ in his or her daily life. First Corinthians tell us clearly that God's intention is to put us into Christ and make Christ everything to us. I'll just read this. We have seen in chapter 1 that Christ to us is the power and wisdom of God. And of God are we in Christ Jesus, who have become us wisdom, become to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Two, then Paul goes on to tell us that this Christ, who is the last Adam, has been made a life-giving spirit. Now, all that he is to us must be realized, must be experienced, not by any organ of our being, but the spirit. You see, if we don't exercise the spirit in the day, in the day, we cannot experience uh, the Lord in all this multifaceted aspects, rich aspects of this Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, we are told that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. And that uh, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, you just... Take a break from your meeting. You know, by the way, it's better not to sit so long like we do. You know, every half hour, better to stand up at work, whatever you're doing. Just what? Do some deep breathing and just say, Lord, thank you. 
He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I'm one spirit with you, Lord Jesus. You're one spirit with us. Hallelujah. Then you sit down and continue to work. How about that? Dear saints, this is how we would what? Set our mind on the spirit. D, uh, by looking into the context of all the chapters in 1 Corinthians and obtaining a full scope, we realize that the function in the meeting depends on the life in our daily walk. That's love. And the way to meet together properly is to, to meet together properly is to live properly. <clears throat> One, this simply means to take Christ as our life and our everything in our spirit. Therefore, we must learn how to exercise the spirit constantly. The daily life is about a constant exercise of our spirit to touch the Lord, to be one with the Lord. Two, we have seen that the Apostle Paul was one who did this very thing. He was so strong in his spirit. He was forever exercising his spirit. You can read these verses in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, and Colossians 2, 5. Paul's testimony. This is the proper way to live, and this kind of living is the first necessary necessity of the proper way to meet. Now you see, the meeting life has everything to do with our daily life. We mean business, don't we, brothers and sisters? Let us pursue these things. May the Lord, may the Lord encourage all of us, inspire all of us to really seriously pursue such living, to seriously what exercise in the meetings so that there would be what a uplifting, uplifted meeting life of the church for his testimony in all the churches. David, back to you.